Thank you for coming. Beautiful day. Uh, we have a re real uh, treat today. Uh, Bill Curry is going to uh, speak uh, on uh, presidential elections and politics in general. I don't think I've ever met anybody who has uh, more insights. I mean, you'll, you'll hear what I mean. They're not the normal stuff you read in the paper. But they're not off the wall either. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's about half and half. <laughs> he, he, uh, he's a lawyer. He graduated from Georgetown. Yes. Georgetown. Uh, elected state senator here. Uh, then elected state controller, where he did a lot of innovative things. And uh, he ran for governor. Uh, I guess it was against, the first time was against who? Both times. Both I think. Rolling. Rolling. Yeah. Yeah, and he would have been the governor, except he was six months too early before the criminal investigation, <laughs> and Roland went to jail. But he Twice. would have been governor if the attorney general uh, had done his job, mm -hmm. and the press has done its job, mm -hmm. and some Democratic senators have done, have yeah. done their job. And if he had been governor, uh, he would have uh, been very, very innovative in terms of a deliberate democracy. And th that's what this whole effort here at this bookstore and these events uh, are all about. Because if, if we don't make a deliberate democracy our own, we're going to get what we're seeing, a deteriorating society, a deteriorating politics, a deteriorating economy for so many people. He was uh, counselor to President Clinton in the White House. He saw a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Ellie K. Not those no, things. Not everything. Not those <laughs> things. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was a visiting fellow at Yale, uh, and as I said, a two time gubernatorial uh, candidate. And he, he's written a lot of columns for Salon. Has anybody read his columns for Salon? Mm -hmm. Boy, they're really good. I mean, they're long, but they really hold. <laughs> they, they really, really long. long. <laughs> and he's a, a Daily Beast columnist. And he's on uh, uh, NPR a lot. He was on this last oh, week yeah. with Jen Donkowski and uh, uh, Colin, Colin McEnroe. Two very smart people. They're so smart, by the way, they won't go na to the NPR national <laughs> because they don't want to be managed and controlled. Because mm -hmm. here they can be much more their own judgment and discussion. Interesting commentary. Like they would be snapped up immediately at the national level, but it's a bureaucracy uh, and NPR. And uh, he uh, he's going to talk about one of the more bizarre elections in American history. You can only guess. That's <laughs> coming up. My sum up of Bill is a little uh, uh, bizarre too. So. <laughs> He's, he's almost fresh from the Maine woods, but Bill, look at Bill as a curry stew. Okay. <laughs> he's he's, he's one-third Henry Thoreau. He's one-third uh, Harold Lasky. Uh, he's one-third Bill Curry. And with a sprinkling of Buddhist philosophy. And enormously well-read. That's what I call the curry stew. And here he is. Mm -hmm. all his flavor. Wow, I've got such a great picture of me on the flyer. It's so you're old. <laughs> <laughs> but you're an action shot. Yeah, yeah, it's an action shot. Um, so um, welcome to this morning's uh, lecture entitled Meditation on the Career of Nobel Laureate Bob Dylan. <laughs> I'm sorry, wait a minute. <laughs> um, so what I, I want to try to do is to uh, curve myself a little bit here and keep this shorter in order to have what the ideal Ralph talked about transpire, which is a, a democratic deliberative discussion. And, um, and so let me just say a little bit, what I'm going to just do is the, is the merest fun sketch of an overview of um, how we got here and, um, and how we get out. Um, and I want to say that a couple of things. Um, 
By the way, does anybody have a pen that can let me have that? Yeah, testing your Yeah, one third Willie <laughs> one third Willie Mays. Right. <laughs> and uh, uh, the um, and the first so what I want to do and talk about how we got here is try to dispel some ideas that I read constantly in the newspapers and I hear constantly on daily television and uh, and often from my own party I'm a I'm a Democrat uh, and uh, I didn't say smaller capital D I just said Democrat but I am. Um, and, and we'll talk about that at the end. And, but the first thing, the first idea is that um, something that um, something that President Obama says a lot. Um, whenever President Obama is asked about what his biggest mistake was, I've seen him in at least three interviews do this. He always says that the biggest mistake of his presidency was his failure to explain his policies better to the American people. And. Uh, while there are so many things about President Obama that I respect and, and admire, um, I think he's wrong about that. I think that, um, and when I hear him say that, I think when I hear him say it's a very nice way of saying, you don't understand how much I've done for you. <laughs> uh, I should have done a better job of explaining it. And in fact, I think the American people may understand his policies a little better than he does. Hmm. And that it's precisely the problem, the problem lies in the policies themselves. And when the president ran for election in 2008, he ran the peroration of all of his stump speeches was the promise of comprehensive ethics reform. The government, as Ralph likes to say, was already so odious even in the eyes of patriots that cleaning it up was the most popular idea in the country. Very few people polled it. Scott Rasmussen's polled it. Sammy Greenberg's polled it. Most pollsters don't bother to poll public corruption issues because they themselves depend on pay-to-play politics for a living and they constantly talk their, talk their clients out of thinking that it really matters. When Rasmussen did exit polls in two straight elections in the teeth of the recession, people put public corruption above both jobs and the economy as the number one reason they came out to vote. Mm -hmm. And there is, across the world, a pandemic of corruption brought on by globalization. And there's at the same time a global insurrection against it. And it can express itself in a neo-fascist way, it can express itself in a progressive way, it has all kinds of expressions. Uh, but uh, that public corruption is one case. Other things he ran on were a public option, a minimum wage, a promise that he would bail out not just the banks, but the homeowners. Uh, when you look back at those promises, there's a, there are a couple of misconceptions we have about those. Um, and, and the first is, remember that in the first two years, the president had both houses of Congress, the House and the Senate. And he chose not to raise the minimum wage because he thought it would offend the allies he made. He was the first Democrat in history to outraise a Republican on Wall Street. It never happened. Only he and President Clinton, among all Democrats, had ever outspent a Republican or competed with them in finance, but the total outspending uh, Clinton just barely over Bob Dole when he was running for re-election, just by a sliver. And Obama, by the most that any candidate was ever outspent, Obama outspent McCain by more than Nixon outspent McGovern, and by more than two to one. Barry Goldwater outspent Lyndon Johnson. To, talk, to see the sea change in the financing of politics and of the Democratic Party that has happened in these 20 years, it helps to just kind of go through these numbers and, and, and understand. And so when he got in, while, while he said he was good in the public option, he met privately with that and other insurers and promised to kill him. And you can begin to see in the very beginning he would say whenever asked, well, I'm for the public option, but we can't have everything. <coughs> you know, in the newspapers, <coughs> the shift of position. Uh, some professors at Berkeley said it would have cost, it would have shaved $2 trillion off the long-term debt of the United States and taken the issue of the budget deficit off the table. <coughs> Done the public op. He didn't know the amount of harm he was doing himself because every person he hired to work on health care, every single top person on the health care team was a former lobbyist or consultant for the insurance industry. And so there were two great deals made one with the insurance industry, one with the pharmaceutical industry. And they made Obamacare untenable. And it is. You know, the right wing has been writing about this for a few years now. 
they're wrong in all their prescriptions and they're wrong in all the vitriol they throw at it. But the fundamental idea that you can't grandfather in the extortionate profits of the insurance and pharmaceutical industry and still afford to provide universal health care, that's the truth. During the last election, Hillary Clinton would say often that Bernie Sanders' idea of single-payer health care was a fantasy. And she would actually scold him for spreading such a false idea. The idea that Obamacare can be made affordable was actually a fantasy. Anybody with a, anybody with a degree in accounting or who ever had to pay a health care premium knows it. It's not, it's not doable. Single payer is the reason some form of it has been adopted in almost every developed country is that it is affordable. The idea that single payer isn't affordable and that Obamacare is affordable contradicts everything we read, all data we imbibe every day in the subject of healthcare. There is no data to support the claim. But watch how the press, watch everyone, how everyone bought into it. In that first year, he also promised, by the way, to bail out the homeowners, 18 million people whose mortgages went underwater from the 2007-2008 financial crisis. They ended up getting, a, a handful of them got a, a, a little bit, but 50 to 16 of the 18 million never got paid. And when he had the chance to put the money into their pockets, he decided not to. If the president had, had stayed faithful, and the last thing was ethics reform, he's before he said, said get that point. The biggest, uh, at the end of the campaign, the fall of 2008, the promise of ethics reform dominated his speeches. He was going to clean up Washington's culture. He was going to make sure the lobbyists didn't own the table. He wasn't going to hire a single lobbyist to come into the White House and work. He was going to let C-SPAN cameras into the health care negotiations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. None of those were issues that required support of Congress, let alone Republican. Every one of those promises could be implemented by executive order, and not one of them ever was. Mm -hmm. Those were decisions. Well, President Obama done a lot of good things. There's much to admire about it. But if you stop and look at these basic issues of the fundamental distribution of power and opportunity, uh, and, and you think what it would have been like if we got the public option to bring the cost of health care premiums for small businesses and the self-employed down 25 or 30 percent while giving government that, government that uh, 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 relief. I, I'm very proud of this. I'm going to just blow my own horn for one moment. That is that I had used the first public option in America in 1991 when I got elected control. We passed it to the state senate before the insurance and the committee squashed it. And I did my own research then. We found that Connecticut small businesses would get an immediate 25% in cut premiums and also deductibles and co-pays would go down. I believed it was the one way to get to single payer, politically and practically. If you gave people the option of joining the health care plan of the state, and you included all the municipalities with the state employees and retirees and the nonprofits, and you let the businessmen come in voluntarily, we would be a de facto single payer system within five years. Because there isn't any way that a corrupt system can compete with a clean system. It's not possible. And um, I wish we were able to do that. If there had been one example of a public option of, uh, up in one in the country, it would have been irresistible because it would have been a debate, it would have been an example. But all those were things that the Democratic Party chose not to do. And, um, and if he'd done all those things, I believe the president would have been a folk hero rather than a punching bag. Uh, and that the real problem we focus very much on the problems of race and gender and cultural issues, but these basic economic issues, these underlying economic issues, sort of the difference between the Democratic coalition today and the FDR coalition, is the FDR coalition was based upon fundamental political and economic reforms of benefit to the great broad middle class and those aspiring to be And this coalition is based on much more on cultural issues. So, the second thing, so the, the first thing I'm going to say is that people did, that the problem here is policy. And when the president says we don't understand that, that he wished he did a better job explaining his differences to people, um, and what, what he's saying uh, in, in, in part is that if they understood better, they'd be all in one group in supporting what the Democrats are doing. And I don't think that's true. Um, I think there's lots of reason to think that, that it isn't true. And the, the second thing I wanted to say is that the idea we have is that, is that this election came after a long period of partisan gridlock. You've heard this partisan polarization, partisan gridlock, Washington's broken, 
if only these guys could get together and, and work things out among the two parties, everything would be better. And I just want to say that that's also wrong. Uh, that there are, and I just want to talk about two different kinds of consensus, the elite consensus and the popular consensus. And at the top, there is no partisan gridlock about the global trade. The elites of both parties are completely agreed. There is no partisan, there was no partisan gridlock about the Iraq war. The elites of both parties were in complete agreement. There was no partisan gridlock about no child left behind in the corporatist education reforms. Complete agreement. In fact, the healthcare, things did become partisan at a grassroots level, but what we have, Obamacare, is Romney care. It, it really did come out originally out of the Heritage Foundation. There was no real difference between the elites on the health care program but before that. Uh, there was much less difference than you think about energy. Uh, and uh, above all, uh, uh, on deregulation of Wall Street and the financial sector, the elites of both parties were in agreement. If you took the speeches in the 1990s of Newt Gingrich, Al Gore, and Bill Clinton, and rubbed out all the personal references, and just looked at what each person said about global trade, about information technology boom being the rising tide that lift all boats, um, uh, 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 about national defense, about all these things, uh, uh, education, they were all saying the same thing. You, you, you couldn't tell the speeches apart. There was a tremendous Mitch McConnell, uh, uh, Paul Ryan, President Obama, President Clinton. On these issues, they're in complete agreement. There has been virtually no daylight between them. And so I would argue that the last thing you need is bipartisan consensus. But whatever these people are left unattended, they do things that you really, you know, the, the deficit is the biggest bipartisan agreement of all. Agreeing on policies that leave the country broke and owing money. And the biggest, and, but even bigger than that is the agreement on pay-to-play -pay politics. And again, it's an ideology. There's an elite ideology. And the elite ideology is that things like global, that especially globalization and pay-to-play -pay politics are inevitable. It's, it's like the poor will always be with us. It's the way of all flesh. They see, like every ideology thinks that its thinking is scientific and that everybody else is being really subjective. And it's easy to see if it's on the far left or the far right. But the ideology of the center is very hard to detect. Okay? And, and, and when they're saying things that aren't really empirical, they say everything they think is empirical, nobody else. But pay to play politics is not inevitable. This was a much more ethical country 30 years ago than it is today. Uh, we had a much higher uh, standard of ethics and a much lower role of, of money in politics, a much smaller role. And so that bipartisan, there is a, you know, the, the, there is a bipartisan consensus at the top. The partisan polarization is more of a public thing, and it's more for the rank and file. And it's all over cultural issues. Uh, you, abortion, uh, gun safety, same-sex marriage, transgender bathrooms. You can list the five or six things that are most in the news. And I'll tell, if you tell me where you are in one of them, I'll tell you where you are in all of them. And if you tell me what, where you are in one of them, I'll tell you which party you belong to. And it's not, I'm not saying these issues are not without importance. They all deserve our support. But they become the way in which the parties hold their base together in an era in which they're not doing anything for them economically, in which they're not doing their job on the fundamental issues. So you have the appearance of partisan gridlock over hot button cultural issues uh, at the bottom and the, actu and, and the actuality of bipartisan consensus at the top. And that's what this election was about. The reason there was so much overlap in between the Venn diagrams of Sanders and Trump on so many issues, not the xenophobia, the racism, the misogyny, etc., uh, but on a number of other issues, is that there really is a, 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 a debate from the, you know, from, from the bottom to the top is the more important debate than from left to right. And it is a debate that shatters all the old categories. And uh, it is a debate um, that's really good news, actually, in many ways, and it's finally happening. But it has yet to be clarified. And um, I just want to say that um, the, the tragedy of this year uh, is that um, uh, as I would argue, that every well, there were lots of comparisons between this time and the Great Depression, when the when the financial uh, implosion occurred on Wall Street in 2008. You know, the worst recession since the Great Depression. Not actually true. 82 was worse by almost every 
uh, standard that really counts, unemployment, poverty levels, etc. But the way in which we're still like the Great Depression is that every big institution is broken. All the big systems are broken. And at a time in which everything big is broken, healthcare, we have the wrong healthcare, we have the wrong energy, we have the wrong defense, we have the, the war on drugs, the education policy, every big choice we've made is wrong. It's one of the things that's, that's wrong about the education today. The corporate education that we have, that we're having is premised on the idea that America's in trouble because our children aren't better workers, aren't becoming better workers. Or America's in trouble because we're not becoming better citizens. All of the choices, the worst choices we've made, we've made in the public sector. If we sit to make intelligently, we'd be fine. We'd be doing, we'd be going gangbusters right now. And when you realize that you're educating a whole system and not uh, a whole citizen and not just a worker, your whole sense of what goes on in the classroom changes. You, you understand the problem and you, 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 you release your whole set of uh, uh, conclusions. And the, 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 the country tried hard to have this debate. And one of the things that the president has said many times also, he says that I should have done a better job of, of explaining my policies. And I think we need that we need to better policies. And then he'll say the Republicans created Trump. And again, the Republicans are really, really responsible for this, and they should never be allowed to walk, walk away from it. This truly is a fascist by every textbook definition of the term. When you incite your followers to violence, when you threaten to jail your opponents and use the power of government to silence your critics, when you trade in conspiracy mongering and xenophobia and racism, when you believe in the propagandistic big lie. Uh, fascism isn't an ideology. You can be for or against global trade or health care or minimum wage or any other specific policy and still be a fascist. It doesn't matter. The things I just listed are the things that, that make a fascist. And one of the failures, I think, of the media was that we didn't use the word earlier. We didn't, we didn't name, you have to bell every cat in the school. And we should have named it early on, and we should be naming it now. I know it's a divisive word, it's a difficult word, but as long as fascism is so much on the rise in so many countries in the world, it would be good to have it handy. Um, so the, um, the idea is that, you know, that basically what happened here is that, the, 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 you know, Rupert Murdoch and the Kochs and all these people spent all this time funding funding hate speech in lieu of actual politics. And then finally it blew up on them. The monster escaped the laboratory, and now they don't know what to do, and shame on that. And it's partly true. But as with the discussions over terrorism, the other question is, who created the market for this? People have been funding this kind of politics and this kind of speech since forever. And what makes this the moment that that if uh, the actual fascist gets as close to presidential power, as it, closer to presidential power than anyone ever has in the history of America. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that you have to take a look and ask what has this global finance capital order created? Uh, you know, I look about me and I see, the, 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 I, I look at the disempowerment of the white working class and their experience over these years. I see how susceptible people grow to the siren call of some of the darkest themes in all the politics. I see how we let people down. Uh, when, when you go decades and you never hear your name called in that debate, you hear lots of people's problems, important problems discussed, but your name never gets called. And you've lost the savings in your house, and you've lost your, your defined benefit pension, and your kid dropped out of college and can't afford it and you haven't had a real raise in 40 years, I know that in my own life, the worst decisions I've ever made, I was either angry or afraid. It's the same for a country. When people are angry and afraid to make terrible decisions. The worst thing we can do watching this election is to conclude that, a vote, that all the votes for Trump that are going to win it. Tell us who we are. Because we've fallen far, but we haven't fallen yet. And there are people who are simply so angry and so afraid, they're falling for things that they won't always fall for if we can do our jobs. And um, I would just say, you know, that I used to do this when I was doing more public speaking. And I've really moved again lately, but we go to you know, Rotary River. And uh, at the end of the speech, I would say to people, I want everybody to close their eyes. And for a minute, I want you to imagine 
from think, just think of all the images of, uh, you've seen in cable television and in larger media of who are the American people. Just think of all those images you've seen and who are the American people and just think about them. And now, do that for a minute and then if you can, try to put them out of your mind. It'll be very hard because they're very powerful. But see if you can put them out of your mind and replace them with the images of people you've actually met. That could be like, people you didn't like, people who helped you fix a flat tire, people who rode by, uh, relatives, friends, semi-strangers, everybody you've met in your own life. And I think the one first thing you conclude is that we don't hate each other nearly as much in real life as we do on hate coverage. And the American people are more open-hearted and, and more open-minded than they are on cable television. And James Madison said that if you don't believe in the good heart of people, you can't believe in democracy. I think that's correct. And the worst thing we can do is, you know, whenever a speaker gets up, I'm, I'm giving you the best I've got this morning because I assume that's what you want and that's what you respond to. I assume that's who you are. And if I assume less of you, I'll give you something different. Everybody does. And one of the things that's happened to Democrats is that as much faith as people have lost in politicians, politicians have lost that much faith in people. And what they give them um, is insulting. Insult um, to their, not only to their intelligence but to their humanity. And so I want to just stop talking now. And I just want to say that uh, there's a lot of other ideas that I should have been filling in if I went along, but it's too much. Let me just say this though. Here's the really good news. You want good news? Yeah, yeah of course you do. All right. Who doesn't really at any given Saturday morning? Here's the deal. And it's true. There's a very good chance that we're about to have a different kind of politics here. And the election is in 24 days. It means the debate begins in 25. Okay? And we will no longer be discussing the brokenness of one little man. We'll be discussing the brokenness of the country and how to fix it. And there are going to be two debates. And with luck, Hillary Clinton will be elected. I'll go back to that in a minute if you want. But if she is, there'll be two debates. There'll be a debate with the Republican Party about who to kill. Okay? <laughs> and that'll be richly entertaining. Right? <laughs> and that's going to go on for a long time. Because they don't do anger management very well. <laughs> On the Democratic side, there could be a different debate. And I think it's, it, it, and this relates to some things that Ralph has been speaking about in conferences and writing about and talking about. And it's something I've been getting a great deal of thought about. I have an article coming up soon on this. Um, I just finished working up. And, and that is that we have to stop and think about what, what happens 801 election? Okay? And this whole question, like, you know, who do you vote for? Who do you, you know, all these divides about the tactics of this general election, tactics of what all of it's all over election day. And in the 1990s, Bill Clinton held the Democratic Party together by force of uh, his charisma, really. And, uh, he didn't so much reconcile the differences as he grossed them in his personality. Barack Obama did the same thing in the 2000s. The person holding the Democratic Party together today is Donald Trump. Okay? Uh, he's serving that role for us now. And no matter what happens in election day, he won't be able to do that again. And Hillary Clinton has many strengths, but she won't be able to hold the party together in that way, not in that charismatic way, not by force of personality, because she's different, because the times are different, because that hustles run its course. And people understand their differences, and the, and the issues are more urgent than they were in the 90s, and we're right up against it now. And so we have to do something. And that fight between the progressive base of the Democratic Party and its elite leadership will be the real debate in the country. It'll be an intra-party debate. The Republicans are just debating how far in the past, in the past they can drag us. The question for the Democrats is whether or not they're going to try to drag us into the future. It's a better debate. And the power of the people who want change, if smartly aligned with the majority sentiment for change in this country, can be overwhelming. If we happen to win both houses of the Congress, which I wouldn't predict, but, but, but which is not impossible, 
you could move uh, a, a living wage in a public option. And it, there was a great deal. Bernie Sanders, who's been a tremendous sport, says that uh, uh, says that uh, this is the most progressive platform in the history of the Democratic Party. It, it's not actually. I've read them all. Uh, I'm sad to say. <laughs> I'm getting a life suit, so I may not read the next one. So just so you all know, but you're, you're going to be on your own. You're going to have to do this. 2008 platform was more progressive. Uh, uh, foreign policy on defense on public integrity. They took all the stuff about revolving doors, no bid contracts, defending whistleblowers. They took it out of this platform. There's nothing in this about re-examining our, our foreign policy um, uh, and, and defense policy. There are lots of things wrong with it. And the major thing wrong with it, though, is that it, it, does, it matters what's in the platform. I, I helped write two national platforms. I actually I pretty much wrote a couple state platforms because no one else cared. It's the kind of thing if you're interested in doing, you could do. <laughs> um, and um, on the state level, for sure. And the, um, but but it, it matters what's in them, but what really matters is whether the people writing on them really mean it. That's what matters. If we could just have what was promised in the 2008 platform, public option, ethics reform, a living wage, a real crackdown on, the, on a financial sector that stops serving if we could have a more enlightened form of defense policy. If we really had that platform promise, let alone this one, I'd be living there. You know, things would be a lot better. Mm -hmm. A lot better, meaningfully better. And, um, and so there's a chance you have to begin a struggle. And it, it's a struggle that goes on best when there's a Democratic president, regardless of who it is. The people who think that if you get Trump, you'll be able to have a big uprising because they'll get everybody angry. People told me that about Reagan. It took 40 years just to get Bernie. Okay, uh, Democrat Republican presidents they drag the debate with them. Uh, and uh, and the second thing is, this time I think the differences are there. Um, the last thing I'm going to say is this, and this really will wind it up. What kind of progressive movement we have in matter? And previously, in the glory days of the most recent generation of progressives. Ralph Nader, Gloria Steinem, Martin Luther King, the leaders of the great progressive movements of the 60s and 70s, and then died off. I was the first director of the nuclear freeze movement, arguably the last one. And, um, uh, and they, they, they hadn't been colonized by one political party. They, they stayed at arm's length in relationship to both parties. They, they never did endorsements, let alone run, in, in all those years. Um, they distrusted electoral politics, and they knew there were other kinds of politics that you had to engage in in order to get social change. They knew it better than progressives today seem to understand our, our hyper focus on, on, um, on electoral politics, I think, and to our detriment. And the arm's length relationship is better for the progressives and the Democratic Party. The people in Washington, the organizations in Washington, in labor, environmental organizations, there are many that were once great grassroots movements that became instead Washington lobbyists with grassroots mailing lists who traded the politics of pressure for the politics of access. They ought to ask themselves what they got for their members and their people, not themselves, for their members. And we ought to ask what we need to do. And the first thing we need to do is realize that we need a new progressive movement. That a lot of those organizations, they're never coming back. They are who they are. They no longer have grassroots leaders. They have Washington careerists. They lobby so much, they look at the world through the eyes of their subcommittee chairman. They're afraid to offend uh, people. They don't engage the American people in an attempt to mobilize public opinion. The power of ideas is greater than the power of money. Because the power of public opinion trumps everything, even in a democracy that's corrupted. It's still true. All you have to do is believe it. So help me. And you can see it every so often in same-sex marriage, where you, you watch how, how ideas change and how they roll over the establishment. It can happen. Um, but we really have to see that we're going to need, there are new organizations, Working Families Party, 350.org, there are all kinds of uh, organizations doing all kinds of different things. Ralph's talking about breaking through the power. We have to sit down and figure out how this, how this could happen. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, you remember Debbie, <laughs> um, Debbie Wasserman Schultz was a disingenuous person. She was a Democratic National Committee Chair who lobbied for the payday loan industry, which is worse than anything she did with Bernie. Uh, mm -hmm. So she did Bernie's death. But that's not why Bernie lost. The labor movement delivered this to Hillary. 
if the teachers hadn't been living in Massachusetts, if AFSCME hadn't been living in Iowa, if the culinary workers hadn't been living in Nevada, Illinois, there are five or six states she couldn't have come closer. Uh, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a progressive coalition around me. That's what mattered in the end, and it wasn't money. The great thing about this election, you can't correlate spending to electoral success in either party or either. That's something people need to stop and absorb the, the meaning of. So we have to build something new. And we have to be prepared. I would argue, I'm, I'm voting for Hillary Clinton because I think when you see fascism, your first duty is to kill mm -hmm. it. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also believe that the bigger, I want the country to have a collective memory of having defeated this guy by as much as possible. That the collective memory that this is not acceptable in America. And if there's a chance of picking up the House and Senate, I want. And then on 801, I go right back to the more or less loyal opposition. I don't know that anybody criticized Secretary Clinton more than any Democrat, I don't think, criticized him more than I did in Clinton over the last year. And I tried to take part of, part of his policy. And as I said then, I, I like her. She's been very kind to me. People say, what are the things you do? I say, nothing. I like it. And this isn't about one person's character. Uh, you know, what the WikiLeaks, what, what you see is the curtain drawn on the whole system. That's what we're seeing here. That's what has to change. The question isn't whether one person is more corrupt than another. The question is whether you know that the whole system is corrupt and whether to change it. That's the question. And I'm not persuaded that she does, but I'm persuaded that the grassroots of this party does, and that the building kind of movement we need will get to changes in corruption. Uh, we'll, and, and, and we'll get to the changes in every one of these fundamentally broken systems. And we could have, be about to have the greatest political debate we've had in half a century. After all this, that could actually happen. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to try to talk a lot less now. As you, some of you know, that that would be hard for me. <laughs> um, but I'd like to hear what people might have to say in response to all this. And, and I see Charlene. Wait a minute. You look like a third grader. Don't you? Oh, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Bill, you know, on the, you weren't here last night, and some of my friend our, David, our audience wasn't here last night. But on the heels of David's talk last night, in a very interesting book about the effects of the. Two Did you want to say the title while we're here? On the <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I, I do the NPR way. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, uh, he he really helped us understand what happened in 2010 and the Republican strategy to gerrymander these districts into ways that really, they could never lose the House. And it, sound, it sounds it's very convincing on the numbers and the facts. So even if Hillary were to be able to were to pull off a landslide elect, electoral and um, voter victory, it seems to me, after hearing David last night, there's just no way we're going to get, just because of the way these, struck, these house seats are structured now, be able to get the house back. What are, you, what are your thoughts? I know you know about the gerrymandering problem, so plug that into what you're thinking. You're saying they gerrymandered the districts? <laughs> <laughs> We're sitting in one. Holy moly. He's even got diagrams. <laughs> wow, that's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> well, as soon as the people find out, they won't put up with <laughs> it. Um, okay. A couple of thoughts. First of all, I just want to point out that, that you know, to, to, to nail Obama to the wall, they have the court, the Senate, and the House. They had to cut off everywhere. There's a really good chance they won't have the court or the Senate. And that's important. In their own party, they're about to have a civil war. I mean a civil war. You. Third parties do not arise in America. Sorry, my green friends, but it, it doesn't happen. It only happens when a party dies. When the Whigs died, the Republicans were born. A party has to actually die. And, and under this system, and you all know about it, I'm not going to do it, but one has to die. And the other way they can change is to be really transmogrified without actually disappearing. And the Republicans picked up all the you know, South and, uh, and the Democrats picked up the professional suburbs. They became each of them a different party in different ways. Um, in some ways, regrettable on both sides, but mostly for the Republicans. And uh, and so, uh, 
I don't want to overdate what's going to happen here. But there is a fundamental question here. If we can take the, the basic principles that Bernie ran on and really fight for them, again, I, you know, start primarying some of these Democrats. You know, look at the Tea Party model. Look at the Tea Party model. I would argue in, the, the, the model that's most likely is the Working Families Party. And not in tone or culture or you, anything. But, you know, the, 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 you have the Green Party, which always runs an independent in every race. And you have the Working Families Party, which sometimes primaries, sometimes co-endorses, and sometimes runs an independent, depending on what makes tactical sense in that moment. I'm for that model. Uh, if progressives had half the influence over the Democratic Party, the Republicans, the, the Tea Party has over the Republicans, we think we died and went to heaven. Okay, we, we, think that, we think it was like, you know, the end times. And, um, and so I want that new movement to be very much focused. There are people, you know, you, 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 Chuck Schumer gets named majority leader without even a vote in his caucus. He's the most important person working on behalf of Wall Street in the United States Congress. It should have been a primary, not a, not a, not a voice vote for majority or minority leader, depending. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, getting rid of Debbie Wasserman Schultz, that would have been a nice thing. Even two or three of them like that would begin to change the tone. There's nothing the herd notices that are more than a coma. Uh, and so those things all matter. If you took the House, I, I don't think that's quite true. I think she'd have to get up to 10 or 11 points. And the amazing thing now is, again, you know, Johnson beat Goldwater by 20, and Nixon won by 20, uh, I, uh, FDR won by more than 20 and 36. Uh, this is a five-point race, six-point race right now. This has not become anything approaching the landslide. The stubborn resistance, and again, I, I told people I was giving a speech in Germany in June, and I said, you know, I live in a really blue state. And in our blue state of Connecticut, we have all Democratic office holders. In our small towns, we often have budget referenda on mostly education issues. And as blue as we are, in the budget referenda, the anti-education forces win more often than not. They win at least the first round and have to go back. Yeah. And all my life, I listened to some of my liberal friends tell me it's because the senior citizens are a bunch of greedy geezers. Oh, yeah. and, and they never got um, two things. One, which is that the property tax is so fundamentally unfair that the people who say they're paying too much for education really are. And it's because of the nature of the system. And then my party, uh, except when I was running for governor, never brought the issue up. Uh, and, uh, and and that's why. Starting to now. Yeah, they're finally starting they're now. Finally. But yeah, it, but uh, but the, and the second reason though is that those referenda. They're the only chance that anybody in Connecticut gets to say no. And it's kind of like the Brexit vote, you know. You, you, you know, this is their one chance to say no. And in some ways, I, I think that's what Trump is. For lots of decent people, I I went in a stop and chat parking lot the other day. Tell me that I was his favorite politician in his life in Connecticut. He said he hoped I'd run again. And I said, "That's not me, thank you." And I said, "Who are you voting for?" And he said, uh, "You can see this coming, right?" Yeah. <laughs> Trump. And I said, "Really?" <laughs> uh, you know, you know, you heard this cognitive dissonance thing. I'm having it here. You know, <laughs> and uh, you know, how is that? And he said, well, I don't like his language, and I don't like a lot of his politics. I just think it's the only chance we're going to get to build up the system. So I talked to him for a long time. I don't know what he's going to do. Um, but, um, but, but that's there. When we, if we come out with the right platform, if she takes office in this platform of these positions that she's adopted without really absorbing public option, trade, etc., if there's enough of a movement to put that pressure on, that will affect the Republicans. They hate having to vote on the public option. They'll hate having to vote on they, they always run away from vote on minimum wage. There are a set of things they live in fear of because they know that the majority of their own party supports both those things. Public option, minimum wage, the majority of Republicans support both. Okay. And so they don't want to be trapped. We didn't trap them. And in, in their high ground is the cultural division. Our high ground is the economic and political unification. Okay, but you got to mean it. And it's got to be there. So if we take the House, excuse me, if we take the Senate and we take the Supreme Court away, and they're having a civil war, and we're bringing the right issues and putting them on the table, and they've just had their margin cut in half, then all, all that Clinton has to say is, Speaker Ryan, I, I, I'm not asking for your vote on a single issue. I'm not asking you to ever compromise with me on anything. I don't want your vote. I want a vote. All you have to do 
is let your own people vote your conscience. And the pressure on him from his own donors and elites, from the press, from everywhere, I think it will be substantial. I think if they don't have the Senate and they don't have the Supreme Court and they've had their margin cut to the bone, even if we don't quite take it, I think, uh, it, it, given where they'll be, I think that there's a chance to move everything that I've mentioned that's most important, everything that's most important to progressives, um, two-thirds or more of the American people support in virtually every poll of the day. What they don't support is a government that's corrupt and inefficient. Hillary said she put Bill Clinton back in charge of the economy. Probably not a great idea. Um, but you know what she should put him back in charge of? What he and Gore did, reinventing government. Just trying to do the management reform. So it, it, was a, it was a real thing. They did some good. They should do that again, and then we should demand that we do 